He is the play-by-play man extraordinaire for your Columbus crew. He's taking us all the way through the regular season and the postseason. Had Atlanta in the first of the best of three. Then you get Orlando. Trip down there. You beat them. You take down FC Cincinnati and hell is real. Now you get LAFC tomorrow, 4 o'clock, for an opportunity to hoist the cup. He is Chris Dorn, play-by-play man extraordinaire for your Columbus crew. Chris, happy MLS Cup Eve. How are we feeling, buddy? Massive weekend for the city. Beamer, what a big day today. Last day of uh, kind of taking it in as a fever dream, if you will, for crew fans. And then realizing that tomorrow when we get up, it's all the marbles on the line, man. And we're playing one of the best teams in the Western Conference. And it's going to be an exciting match. Yeah, it's going to be really tremendous. Uh, I can't wait for it, Chris. Now, before we move forward with this match, why don't we look in the past? Can you explain in 2020 when the crew won their last MLS Cup? Can you explain the way that you called that game compared to how it's going to look and feel for you tomorrow? It's going to be remarkably different. On uh, Thursday before for MLS Cup in 2020, we got word that we were not allowed in the broadcast booth at Historic Cruise Stadium because we hadn't taken a recent test for COVID. Uh, this was coming from the league and from the network, Fox. This was not coming from the uh, crew offices. And so they said in order to get into the broadcast booth, myself, Jordan Angeli, our analyst, and our other host, Neil Sika, had to take COVID tests and pass them. Well, we literally, the three of us in a panic, Uh, got on a conference call and we said well what if we don't take the test does that mean that we can't call the game or does it just mean we can't be in the press box we asked the question and uh, as it turns out we were able to not take the test but then we would be reassigned to an outside tent at the end of historic crew stadium over the stage and over the nordeck to call the game I had called plenty of games from the end zone. I mean, if you've been to RFK or if you've been to the uh, any one of the big NFL stadiums, that's how you do it. And so we neglected, or I should say declined the offer to take the COVID test because if one of us had tested positive, yep. Beamer, then that person would not have been admitted into the stadium. And so uh, we just said no on the test, and the three of us called the game, and it was, it was fantastic. Um, we had a great experience. We did it together, which is what we wanted. Uh, And now we have an opportunity this weekend with all that COVID stuff in the past, uh, not just to call another MLS Cup, but to call it from the Palace in the Arena District at Lower.com Field from a radio exclusive booth Mm -hmm. and uh, right over midfield. Well, you haven't gotten the memo yet. This is awkward. Beamer actually rented out that booth, so it looks like you'll be outside the stadium again. So sorry about that. It's a weird time to break that to you, I guess. But uh, at what point during the season did you say this team could win the whole thing? Like at what point, was there a point in the season or a game or a moment? Or was it even the preseason when you said, you know what, this team's got the talent. They could actually run the table here. Uh, Tito, anything can happen in the playoffs. I have to admit, I never said that. Um, I, in the preseason, was like, whoa, this team's got a lot of work to do to get to a point where I think they're playing close to the way the coach wants them to play. Um, We got to the middle of the season and, you know, League's Cup, we're facing St. Louis, and I realized that that's a different tournament, but, you know, St. Louis had been running the table in the Western Conference. We go up against them and we can handle them pretty pretty evenly and then beat them. Um, And then Club America comes to town, and I realized Club America is in the middle of a very long summer where they're having to travel um, to the United States for League's Cup, but we beat them too. And I was like, okay, um, talent's there. We bring in Diego Rossi, Julian Gressel during the uh, trade window. Rudy Camacho comes in. I had not really studied Camacho's style, but I knew he was familiar with what Wilfried Nazi wanted to accomplish here in Columbus. And it started to really settle. Um, I also paid a lot of attention to what Coach said post game and throughout the course of a week of preparation. He was not focused on results. In fact, I'll have an interview tomorrow with uh, President General Manager Tim Bezpachenko where I say to him, a year ago when you brought in Wilfried Nancy, we are two years in a drought from the playoffs, and not once did you or Wilfried Nancy guarantee that we would be in the playoffs at the end of his first year. And I want to know why. And he said it wasn't intentional. It was just that we understood where we wanted to be, and we knew it was going to come, And we just let it all happen sort of organically more than anything else. I think once we got to the playoffs, Tito, more direct to the answer to your question, uh, handling Orlando on the road was a huge test. I mean, Cincinnati notwithstanding, that Orlando victory was huge. That is a tough place to play. That's a difficult team to beat. And we hadn't done it. 
Um, and then to go down to Cincinnati and crawl back after being down 2-0. In 15 minutes, we score two goals. We go into the last 30-minute stanza of overtime, and the number one team in the league doesn't have the numbers to keep up with us. Now, what does that tell you? So I can tell you on my drive home from Cincinnati was when I probably had the realization, don't count us out, and we're coming back home. It was tremendous uh, last Saturday as we check in with Chris Dorn, your play-by-play man for your Columbus crew with us here on the Bryant Heating and Cooling Systems Fan Guest Hotline. And uh, your your call, the Ramirez goal, was so good, Chris, because I think it embodied uh, every crew fan at the time, right? I mean, Molino whips that ball. First of all, Gressel whips the ball in. Uh, Molino gets onto the end of it. Amundsen goes up. Molino gets onto it. And Cucho's just... It's not the guy that you want to miss marking <laughs> on the back post. And he slots right. that right to Christian Ramirez uh, and puts that in. And so as we get to tomorrow, obviously LAFC just won the cup last year. They're coming in here. It's going to be a rainy affair, most likely, uh, down at Lower.com Field. Your coverage is going to begin at 3 o'clock. What to you uh, is the biggest key to victory in this game tomorrow at round 6, depending on extra time, maybe 7 o'clock. Hopefully it doesn't go to penalty kicks that the crew can win their third cup in the franchise's history. Beamer, since we started the playoffs, I've sort of focused, and this is just me, on who has the burden of responsibility in any one game. I felt like in those two home games, Columbus really did a great job of handling their burden of responsibility versus Atlanta. We won both the home games. We lost on the road game, but Atlanta really had the burden in that one. The Orlando game, Orlando had the burden, and Columbus was able to disrupt that And I think Columbus enjoyed going in as the underdog. We go to Cincinnati, who has the burden there, the number one team in the league, and they can't withstand the burden there. I do think the burden shifts to Columbus tomorrow um, because they're at home, uh, because they are the top seed of the two remaining seeds remaining, because Columbus finished uh, ahead of of LAFC in the point standing. So the burden does shift, but I, I think being at home, Uh, gets Columbus over the hump. I also think that they're going to carry a little bit of that underdog mentality because, as you mentioned, LAFC is the defending champ. I think it's difficult to repeat. We haven't seen that in a while. And Columbus is going to rise to the occasion because they've got players who are playing with a bit of a chip on their shoulder. I think Cucho Hernandez is feeling like he may have been overlooked just a little bit. He realizes his numbers may not have been exactly where he wanted them to be. Um, I think Diego Rossi just plays with a blindfold on and he he destroys people. Uh, Rudy Camacho has wanted to be in this spot for a long time. Julian Gressel, Aiden Morris have been in this spot before. And then you've got the X factor in the midfield, and that's Darlington Nagby. Mm -hmm. Uh, 13 years in the season. This guy is playing for yet another MLS Cup with his third team. This will be the fourth title on the line for him in, in nine years. And uh, I, I just can't get over that statistic. And when you pad it with all of the positive commentary from every teammate about what Darlington means to them on the field and off, you can't help but think that he might actually be the guy who drives this train right through LAFC tomorrow afternoon. It's going to be tremendous. Darlington, uh, unbelievable player and more of a stand-up individual than he is a player for our community uh, in the organization, and I agree with you 100%. He could dribble the ball around Chris for 90-plus minutes, and the ball would never be one or, one off of him. Like, that's uh, just kind of the player he is. Cucho gets the headlines. Diego Rossi gets the headlines. Those guys do who scores the goals. But Darlington is the driver of this team. Buddy, always appreciate the time. Thanks so much for waking up with us this morning. Can't wait to listen to you tomorrow on the call. I have a beer for you over at Lower.com Field uh, tomorrow before the game. Have a fantastic call, Chris. Enjoy it. And we'll check in again soon, hopefully, as MLS Cup champs, all right? Beamer, Tito, Shark, you guys have a great weekend and go crew.